Good evening and welcome to the last in our series of Antarctica Insight Live. This special edition is brought to you in partnership with Dundee Heritage Trust, um, the home of the historic polar ship, the uh, Royal Research Ship Discovery, and we'll be talking a little bit more about her later on. If you're a seasoned viewer of the series, then welcome back. And if this is your first, then a big welcome to you. And may I please direct you to the recordings of the previous episodes where you can catch up on all the fascinating conversations we've been having over the last few months. Our intention for the season <clears throat> has been to explore uh, Antarctica in a bit more depth through the eyes and experience of those working and studying there. We've brought experts from around the world to offer their perspectives and insights on questions both modern and historical to help us better understand this endlessly fascinating continent. And I hope we have achieved that to some degree. Um, we'd love to hear from you about how well we've done on that and what you found interesting. So please do let us know. This whole series has been made possible with our season partner, Viking, who are generously supporting Antarctica Insight Live. So thank you very much to, to them. My name is Camilla Nicholl and I'm the CEO of the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. And I'm delighted you're able to join us tonight. This evening, we're looking at how we humans can design our way into surviving and thriving in Antarctica. Antarctica is, of course, known as the coldest, windiest and driest continent on Earth, <clears throat> a place inhospitable to all but the most well-adapted species, and a place certainly inhospitable to mere humans without additional protection. So creating that protection to help enable us to keep us warm, to help function, to move around and to carry out work in Antarctica has been the task of designers and architects and shipbuilders and, uh, and, uh, and uh, tailors for two centuries. But of course, many of these designs take inspiration from nature, from indigenous communities in other parts of the world, and from science. And today there is an additional imperative, not only to help people survive in this environment, to make sure, but to make sure that not only do these products perform well, but that their environmental impact is minimal. Tonight, uh, we're going to explore a bit more about how design has created solutions to making Antarctica survivable, and what has changed and what has remained constant during the last century or so. So it's with my great pleasure to introduce you three speakers tonight. Uh, we have Kim Turford from Dundee Heritage Trust, who will be sharing some of her, the secrets of polar ships. So welcome to Kim. Hi, thanks for having oh, me. Great to see you tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we also have Naomi Chapman from the Scott Polar Research Institute, an expert on polar clothing, in school, including string underpants. More, <laughs> I hope, on those later. Welcome to you and hello. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. <laughs> and finally, we have Hugh Broughton, the award-winning architect of buildings across Antarctica, including the iconic Halley 6 station. Welcome, Hugh. Great to see Hi. you. Hi. Lovely to be here. So it's wonderful to have you all here tonight. I'm hugely looking forward to the conversation. But first, I'm going to let you each give a short introduction to your area of interest and share us some, some of your insights before we can get into um, searching questions uh, from the audience. So we'll be opening up questions uh, to, you, the, to you, our audience. Uh, so all of you watching live, please do post your questions in the comments and we'll get through as many of those as we possibly can. Um, but first up, can I invite you, Kim, to take the floor and tell us a little bit more about polar shipping? Yes, of course. Hello, everybody. My name is Kim Turford, as we said, and I am the Education and Communities Coordinator for the Royal Research Ship Discovery. Um, I've been in my post at Dundee Heritage Trust only since January this year. And when it comes to understanding the design of our wonderful ship, each day is as fascinating as the last. We are lucky enough to boast a five star heritage detraction at Discovery Point alongside our wonderful ship and the museum tells the thrilling and detailed story of the ship from conception all the way through uh, until it became a museum ship in the 1980s for us. But if you go onto the ship itself, it will easily tell you the story without much interpretation if you know where to look. My usual audience for these types of talks are six and seven year olds, so I will endeavour to keep you as enthralled as they usually are when they step foot on a ship that has actually been to Antarctica. So Discovery's uh, construction began with the laying of the keel um, on the 16th of March 1900. The ship launched just over a year later on the 21st of March 1901, which makes them an impressive 121 years old. And I have to say, they've aged beautifully. This is due to how well they were designed for polar research. The first thing any keen nautical enthusiast or child that's drawn a ship will notice when they step aboard is that there is a complete lack of portholes on the ship's hull. This is because the Dundee Shipbuilders Company 
had to ensure that the ship 133's hull was strong enough to withstand smashing through Antarctic pack ice and also survive the vice-like nature of the ship being frozen in ice. They had previous experience of this as a Dundee whaling trip had gone down to Antarctica just a few years before Scott went down. At the time of its launch, Discovery was thought to be the strongest wooden ship ever built. This is one of the reasons why Ernest Shackleton wanted to purchase Discovery for the now infamous Endurance Expedition. Questions could be asked as to whether he would have actually managed to cross Antarctic if Discovery had been his ship. The lack of portholes and the ship's hull, however, did not mean that the crew were to sail in total darkness. Aside from having modern electricity and lighting on board, the ship's deck is littered with tiny deck light structures known as mushroom vents. They're designed specifically to carry light below decks, whilst waves that were crashing over the side of the ship would not come through into the below decks. They were known as ankle bashers to the crew, um, and you can sort of imagine where that name comes from if you can imagine walking about the deck with all of the huskies and the sheep and every other animal and crew member that was on board. And definitely some of our ship's crew can attest that they do live up to their name. If we walk astern, we find ourselves sitting at the helm on an overhanging structure. This CERN structure was perfectly designed to protect the rudder and the propeller. Perfect if you ignore the leak that had to be corked by the chief engineer en route, however. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that the rudder and the propeller could have been hoisted up before the ice froze over. This is such a simple but effective element of the ship's design that meant that they could escape eventually after so many years of being trapped in the ice. The high stern did protect the crew from waves and ice to some extent, but the steel plated rank stem of the bow was designed to smash through the ice, something that was necessary in the Antarctic conditions. One of those things is the more you look around the Discovery, the more polar design is revealed to you um, in comparison to other ships that were just for naval use, for example. Amidship, you might spot metal fastenings are made of bronze or brass, as opposed to the wrought iron and steel that we see throughout the rest of the ship and that would be traditionally used on other ships. That's because you're standing in the magnetic exclusion zone. It was a vital area on the ship used for navigational equipment that would otherwise be inaccurate if there were magnetic forces at play. This is the main reason that the ship simply had to be built out of timber and not from steel. Unfortunately, Dundee was one of the last remaining cities in the world to specialise in wood shipbuilding. So speaking of timber, we have quite a lot of it. The hull itself is up to 60 centimetres thick at certain points. That's about 23 inches if you're talking old money. And whilst this serves the great purpose of protecting her structure from the forces I mentioned earlier, it could present a significant pr uh, preservation problems to timber over time in a when it's frozen in the ice. This is where our wonderful salt boxes come into play. A salt box is a small letter-like box cut out from the timber that allows salt rocks to be poured in. As the ship is frozen in the ice, the ice will melt, creating fresh water, which will seep into the hull, mix with the salt, and now you have wonderfully preserved ship that should be as strong when the ice thaws. I've been reliably informed that there are 286 salt boxes throughout the hull. So that's as much as I can cram into just an over five minute talk for you folks. There are so many more examples of cutting edge Edwardian design for polar research on board. We invite you to come and visit us if you are able to and see our fantastic ship for yourself. Thank you. Oh, <clears throat> Kim, wonderful. Thank you very much for that. It's uh, fascinating. And uh, we look forward to uh, exploring a little bit more of the, the ship and maybe thinking about a little bit more modern ships as well. OK, thank you. So thank next you. up, we have Naomi from Spry. Um, Naomi, take it away. Thank you. Right. OK, so staying with the Edwardian theme and because I'm from the Scott Polar Research Institute, I'm taking you with Scott, um, but on the British Antarctic Expedition of 1910. So we're on the Terra Nova, basically, the next ship after Discovery. But I'm not going to talk about the ship. I'm going to talk about the crew. 
and what they were wearing. And here they are. So this photograph was taken ooh, about 10 months after landing. And they're all posing there. It's the shore party in a right motley assortment of clothing. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, their clothes. OK, so officially they were taking official kit sponsored by various companies. And here on the left, you can see an advertising photograph from Woolsey who made their underwear and their pyjamas out of merino wool. Very nice it is too. Now, immediately, the crew are starting to adapt things. We've got a nice quote from Scott there at the top. We're making minor improvements all the time, and they really are. So if you zone in really carefully on that Woolsey photograph, you can see there are two pockets at the bottom. But uh, somebody's been adding extra pockets here. You can see they're wearing these pyjama tops as kind of loungewear around camp. And they're sewing on extra pockets. Um, on the far right, you can just see a very tiny little pocket, which the navigator, Bowers, has added. And I'm going to come back to that one later. You can also see some really big pockets. Most of the men were sewing on additional large pockets, um, either to stow useful bits and pieces in or to have them a bit like hand warmers, a bit like you'd get on a modern hoodie. So um, adapting. They did a lot of adapting. And I've recently come across this photograph and the corresponding diary entry as well. Two people refer to Abbott sewing himself a nose protector. Now, we know nose protectors have been used for a very long time, and unfortunately, Abbott was not the first to invent them. Um, they had been around. We have got evidence of them being used in the Arctic as well, and lots of the men separately on the expedition are making extra nose warmers. I thought it was very topical. Couldn't re um, resist adding that one. Talking of adapting, they are adding things. So we've got there a pocket, which you can see in the middle. Um, and I talked about Bowers, the navigator, adding a pocket to his pyjama tops. This is actually an under vest and it's got this tiny little pocket sewn into it. And we know that these were pockets for chronometers. So really useful watches to um, help you navigate. And so lots of people were sewing these into their underwear keep your chronometer nice and warm and very safe. Um, I've also got some examples of, um, at the bottom, there's Wilson, Edward Wilson's vest, and he's changed the alignment of buttons along the shoulder to get a nicer, closer fit. He's also, just above there, he's shortened his long johns, so he's now got short long johns. Um, when you're wearing hefty boots, when you're wearing putties, they took putties, so like that bandaging stuff that you wrap around your trouser legs. Remember, it's the windiest place. You've got to keep, keep the wind out, keep warm. So actually, shorter long johns might be useful. Um, also, I had to include this vest. It is a bit lighter, um, but it's got a lovely skirt on it, so you can tuck it in. Love that. Um, the little um, watercolour drawing on the left, I think is Bowers' bottom crawling into a tent and he's modelling a pair of finesco there. So these are special boots which they had made um, up in the north and um, apparently they had to make them extra large because the lap people who made them had smaller feet. So they're testing these boots, they're using them, they're doing really well, and um, but not in all conditions. So there's a lot of talk of senegrass and how you use it for wicking out sweat, soaking up sweat, um, also using it in mittens. So lots of adaptation. There's also a lot of personalization. Back to Bowers. I'm a bit of a Bowers fan, and he certainly had very famous hats. I'm still on the trail trying to find out. He had a green felt one, which disappeared. He lost it. Um, but he also had this one, which he's modeling in the South Pole photograph. And it kind of got, it's got funny ears or tassels on it. And it makes him really easy to spot. So another photograph at the bottom is showing um, some sledge hauling, some man hauling. And you can easily spot him because of the tassels on his hat. But also, it's official kit, so everything has to be named. 
Some people had little embroidered labels, which they sewed in. And some people had to handwrite labels. So we've got Levick, um, the penguin researcher. We've got his vest by Woolsey, and he's written his name in it. And then on the right, we've got Frank Debenham's man hauling harness, which he's stamped with his initials FD. And still to this day, when you have official kit, it's really good to get it named. You don't want to get it mixed up. Now, really important, mending is an ongoing problem. As Camilla said, coldest, driest, windiest place in the world. There's a lot of repair needed. You don't want to get cold. And yet again, we've got Abbott telling us about the difficulty of mending in cold temperatures. Um, the photograph shows um, Crean and Evans sewing. Um, darning, loads of darning. Um, as you can see, there's, there's also patches being sewn on and safety pins. These appear everywhere. Every photograph, men have safety pins attached to them. They've even painted one into a picture here from, and this is from the South Polar Times, and um, it depicts a storm and their safety pins are flying around. I asked our researchers, our current researchers, if they take mending kits and they said yes, but they no longer use safety pins, they use duct tape, they've assured me, and it's just as good. Um, equipment, they took sewing machines with them they had to keep mending the sewing machines super useful here's the trained um naval petty officer evans he'd done a tailoring course he's sewing inserts for a tent here and then some of the this is scott's mending bag with all the bits and pieces and also orderlies from endurance that's his notebook with a sailcloth needle tucked away inside nice and safely it shows the value of mending equipment and i thought i would end up by assuring you that things don't change through into the 1930s we've got some darning and some knitting some sewing and it still goes on to this day, though I suspect nowhere near as neatly. So thank you for listening. Looking forward to answering some of your questions later. Naomi, thank you so much for that. Uh, and good to see some merino underwear in there. <laughs> but uh, fasc <laughs> fascinating to see how much mending was going on. But uh, essential mm -hmm. if you're away for you know many years at a time. So absolutely. Thank you. Very so I look forward to more pants questions <laughs> shortly. But now, next up is Hugh. Um, so, Hugh, I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about uh, Antarctic architecture. Over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and th hello, everybody. Um, I'm looking forward to showing you um, some images of something a little bit more up to date. This is uh, buildings built literally in the last few years to help look after people working in Antarctica. So, uh, in terms of the work that we've done in the Antarctic, we've actually been lucky to be involved in quite a few different sites, some for the British Antarctic Survey, uh, at sites like Rothera and Halley and Signy, and um, some for other nations, such as working with the Americans at McMurdo, the New with New Zealand in Scott Base, Australia at Davis, and with the Spanish at Juan Carlos. I'm going to start by talking to you a little about our work at Halley Research Station. So Halley, this is the previous station, Halley 5, is located on the Brunt Ice Shelf. And the Brunt Ice Shelf is a 150 metre thick floating ice shelf, which has flowed off the main continent of Antarctica and is moving at approximately 400 metres per annum out to sea. So it's a very dynamic site. This photograph shows the three key buildings of the previous Halley station. There was one which was for people to uh, live and uh, eat their meals in and so on. That's the larger building on the right hand side called the Laws Building. Then there was a building in the middle which was used for uh, atmospheric science and one on the far left which was used for snow chemistry. At Halley, everything that is needed to support the station has to be delivered by ship and the opportunity for the ship to come close to the station arises only in a short period in the Antarctic summer when the sea ice retreats and the ship can come up close to the edge of the ice shelf. But at Halley, a problem was observed at around 2004-2005 period, and it was that a large crack was going to form in the Brunt ice shelf with the potential 
for the a, an area probably the size of a small English county to break off as an iceberg. That was everything to the left of this dashed red line. And Halley 5, the previous station, was on the wrong side of the dashed red line and its legs were frozen in the ice, making it almost impossible to move it to a new location. Therefore, the British Antarctic Survey decided to commission a new station, Halley 6, which could be mobile to escape the fates of the predecessing st uh, stations, which had all been lost as the ice had broken off from the edge of the ice shelf. And this was our design. It was a design based on modular buildings, buildings elevated up on hydraulic legs, which could be lifted up with snow packed underneath to form foundations and supported on giant skis, which would then be not only a means of spreading the load on the ice, but also of relocating the buildings when the time arose to escape from the next carving event of the ice shelf. These modules could be used for energy centers, for bedrooms, for laboratories uh, and other workspaces. And then at the center of the line of modules, we developed a special two-story module, which could be used for the, the uh, residents to live in, for their dining space, uh, for quiet space to get on the internet and for watching TV. In our assessments of the people who worked in Antarctic and in Antarctica, we discovered that they were very fit, active and often interested in the outdoors. So our early scheme provided a climbing wall as a means for them to get from the lower to the upper level when suddenly the British Antarctic Survey's health and safety officer pointed out the proximity of the bar and a decision had to be made as to which element was retained in the base and which was cut out from the scheme. So sadly, we lost the climbing wall at that stage. And here's an image of the completed building as it was opened in 2013 with three buildings on the left hand side, two containing science modules. Uh, then you get an energy module containing generators, water production plant, fire suppression systems, fuel storage and so on. There are two of those so that to provide resilience so that if one breaks down, the other can be relied upon. They're joined by a bridge so that the services can be shared between two sides of the station. But the station is split in two by the bridge so that if there's a fire or another catastrophe in one side, people can still survive living in the other side until they can be rescued, which may be many months down the line. On the right hand side, we have the big red module where everybody lives. Then we have a command module where the base commander is located, the IT server, the doctor is there. Um, there's also a boot room for people's uh, cold weather clothing. And then there are two modules for sleeping in. And there are 16 bedrooms, 18 each, which can be shared in the summer and provide single occupation during the winter. At the extreme uh, south of the station is this science observatory, which is used for observing, for example, uh, ozone measurements within the outer atmosphere. And ozone has been uh, measured at Halley since 1957 when the first station was established and it was in fact three scientists working at Halley in the 1980s who first discovered the hole in the ozone layer just showing the significance of the science carried out by the British Antarctic Survey at places like Halley. Moving down the station, this is at the heart of the big red module where there's a big window to allow lots of natural light in, uh, but it's a window insulated with a special silica gel to prevent it getting too cold inside the space in the depths of winter. As I mentioned, everybody gets their own bedroom in the winter and they share during the summer. Each window has a window, lots of areas for storage. There's even a flip up mirror for doing your makeup. And here's an image of the station at the end of the winter season uh, where the snow has built up to the right hand side, uh, causing big drifts and um, the wind then accelerates underneath the building, keeping the skis clear of snow so that they can be lifted up and the height adjusted when necessary uh, uh, to keep the building level. As a result of designing Halley, we then moved on and designed a number of other stations in polar climates. As I mentioned, we've worked with the Spanish, we've worked with the US in Summit Station in Greenland. We're currently developing a master plan for Davis Station for Australia in East Antarctica. And again, working with the British Antarctic Survey on this building on the top right called the Discovery Building, uh, which is a building for science and operations and will become the nerve center of Bass's operations from Rothera Station. And then the largest project which we're currently involved in is this Scott Base 
which is on Ross Island, where Captain Scott first put, set foot on Antarctica. Um, at, so has a very historic, uh, a great history, I suppose, of exploration. Scott Base was discovered, uh, established in 1957. Um, the original brace comprised six interconnected buildings and three science buildings, um, and then over time has been adapted. But nonetheless, one of the buildings, the uh, original living module, has been beautifully conserved. You can see it on the bottom right there by the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust. However, Scott Base has multiple issues. The building is arranged on multiple different levels. The services are difficult to get to. Lots of the equipment is way past its sell-by date. Fire safety is compromised. The arrangement of buildings causes a lot of snow drift and clearing the snow off the roofs can be very dangerous. So as a result, the New Zealand government decided to replace the building with a new uh, state-of-the-art research facility and here you can see it. It comprises three parallel buildings, all of the same width but of different lengths, connected by bridges as they step down the hillside of Pram Point. The upper building is the one that's used for people to live in, so it's got the dining space, recreation space and bedrooms for 100 people. The middle one is used for science and administration and the bottom one is used for storage and for much of the plant which keeps the building operating all through the year. In terms of devising our designs for the interior, we look back to the past and in particular to Sir Edmund Hillary's uh, designs for his first base at Scott Base from 1957. The building was designed by the Ministry of Public Works, but included lots of clever ideas, including colour psychology to help the team overcome the effects of seasonal affected disorder when it gets so dark in the middle of the winter. And we've transported those ideas from 1957 into the interior of the new base, working with a colour psychologist who has helped us come up with a palette which reflects not only the spirit of Antarctica, but also the spirit of New Zealand, um, giving its firm roots to its cultural origins. And here you can see how that spirit is then applied through the base, even in the most workmanlike spaces, such as the uh, vehicle workshop. And uh, here we see the station operational. It'll be operational from 2028 uh, underneath a spectacular aur aurora with Mount Erebus in the background. Thank you. Hugh, thank you so much for that fascinating insight there. And uh, what an exciting new project that you're working on. So thank you all of you for uh, your fascinating talks. There's a lot, I think, for us to get our teeth into. Um, I want to sort of um, pick up on a on a, in, a question of inspiration for um, sort of designing in in the, the polar regions and trying to design for extremes. So where where would you say the inspiration comes from for the well, clothing or um, the, or buildings or indeed ships? I mean, the, are they are they reflecting uh, previous other cultures um, works or are they, is it is it driven by materials or driven by um, you know the natural world? Can you offer us a bit of insight into into that? Maybe I'll start with uh, you, Naomi, with the clothing. Um, so the clothing, um, definitely they are working with a combination of um, what they know and what they're learning from other people. And um, there's an awful lot being learned from the people of the north. Um I mentioned Finesco, Senegras, and there's great discussion about goggles, famously on Discovery. They're testing out different types of goggles. Um, they are, I mean, the sheer volume of, um, of research they're doing on sledging. And also they're acknowledging, you know, maybe fur, they need to test that more. Um, so there's a whole mixture of things. They're working with what they know and learning, but also learning from their mistakes. Yeah, good answer. But what about ships, Kim? Are they? What, 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 is it purely about science and architecture and, and and thinking about engineering, or is it? Are there kind of is there inspiration from from the past or other other things? Yeah, I think it's really interesting because um, there is obviously um, Pacific Island um, oral histories of people that went down to Antarctica in canoes. Um, the discovery is not a canoe um, so I think it's fair to say that they hadn't really paid too much attention to to those like oral stories probably because they didn't give much weight to them 
Um, but they did look at the whalers, like I mentioned, um, there was a Dundee group that went because they felt like the whaling was um, being dried up up north. They decided to go explore down south. And they obviously had um, Ross's explorations about 40 years earlier or so. Um, so essentially, they were just going with what they knew. And yeah, all of the sort of the fact that it was a research bit ship, the fact that it was built for science, although it didn't get the raw research ship until later, it was built purely for science. So it was blending the, the equipment needs. They knew they needed to take this equipment to go down. Therefore, the, the ship had to make that equipment function. And additionally, taking on what they knew they needed from those previous trips as well, building it all in to create this like one Frankenstein masterpiece of a ship. <laughs> <laughs> but super steady. I mean, I've been in the, in the bowels of the Discovery and it's a, a pretty chunky, oh, <laughs> chunky yeah. lumps of oak have been used in that. And Hugh, I mean, in terms of the buildings, I mean, you're very space age designs that uh, you, you've created. But I mean, thinking into, into the past, how what do you think, where did the inspirations come from for polar buildings? <clears throat> There's a, there's a really nice Maori concept, which I've learned since we've been working on the New Zealand base, which is essentially translated into a foot in the past and an eye on the future. And it's something which definitely, I think, um, drives the design of buildings for polar regions, because, you know, we learn a lot from how people have built buildings in the past. You know, early buildings were built on, on the ice surface, quickly became buried and then crushed by the ice. Subsequent ones were built under the ice. Uh, got crushed much quicker and then of course people learnt to build their buildings elevated so that the wind could um, uh, howl underneath, clear away the snow and therefore the buildings lasted for much longer and also were probably a lot more pleasant to live in because they weren't looking straight into an ice pack when they looked out of the window. Um, so I think there's a, you know, we learn a lot from the past. We we can look, I think, again, at the historic buildings as well of the great explorers. And I always find it fascinating. One of the great benefits of going to uh, uh, Ross Island to work on the New Zealand base is we also had the opportunity to visit both of Scott's huts and Shackleton's hut uh, on Ross Island. Um, and you can see, I think, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, Camilla, but a great difference really between um, Scott's hut and Shackleton's hut. Shackleton's hut seems so comfortable and, and sort of warm and almost inviting, whereas particularly Scott's discovery hut is a cold and uh, quite a hostile kind of environment. And I think between the two, we, we, we learn a lot just of the different uh, sort of um, approaches of the two explorers and of their attitude towards keeping warm, keeping protected, and then supporting the well-being of their crew. And those concepts of supporting well-being are something which we learn from and take into the future of mm. Antarctic architecture. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. I absolutely take your point about uh, the difference between Scott and Shackleton. So I think uh, Discovery Point is very much, you, you look, so we're looking for the ponies, aren't you? You have to be tied up outside. It's a very uh, funny design in that regard and then and then um Kate Royd is uh, like a big snug sort of sleeping bag of a hut isn't it it's uh, fascinating so that sort of brings me a little bit on to kind of materials I mean we talk about ships and the the great oaks of the and the great oak timbers there and then we touched on materials uh, with the architecture but and certainly Naomi you've been talking about fur and um and uh, the different sorts of wool like merino and what have you I mean can you comment a little bit on the kind of materials how they may have changed over over the over the years I mean of course starting with natural fibers I guess and coming up today with very much um uh, technical fibers but uh, what are you seeing what's you seeing the changes and what what's persisted <clears throat> through time um I think the persistent thing has definitely been windproof fabric so we're starting off um 100 years ago with just a very close weave and now obviously modern technology has given us very different windproofing um but also i mean throughout there's been the real importance of of, of wicking of, of sweat um not wanting to be next to the body so you know keeping that separate whether you're using senegrass to absorb it or whether you're wearing um, canvas or wool, which can be relatively easily dried or breathable. Um, and certainly things have changed a lot now. So in modern clothing, we'll have zips and various flaps and drawstrings, so inventing panels so that you, you could adjust your clothing um, according to your temperature and how sweaty you are or not. <laughs> Indeed. And I think that's, they're still issues today, aren't they? I mean, I, I was fascinated, Kim, when, with your um, talk about the ship and the, you know, these great, great timbers that were used for it, but then also that kind of ongoing maintenance with the salt boxes and things. So just talk us a little bit about the materials used in, in the ship and how 
you know how they've persisted and what you know what what may have carried forward into the into the present and the future yeah, so there's multiple different types of wood used on the discovery, for instance. And as I mentioned, the, the metal's the difference whether you're in the magnetic exclusion zone or not. So I think the thing with the research ships is it's all based about the research. So now using satellite technology, for example, and going forward, stuff like that, you can, you're can you not relying as much on magnets and things like that. So your, your ship's got to be built perfectly for the research that you're going to be doing on it. Um, so now we don't necessarily need there to be magnetic exclusion zones. So you can go down in a metal ship, um, which is obviously a lot more sturdier um, than the wood, as Shackleton found out, for instance. Um, not that it makes it entirely safe, but it's definitely a lot safer. So I think there's definitely just the principles of making it as sturdy as possible and making sure that your equipment works because if your equipment w- doesn't work you've wasted a trip <laughs> essentially yeah absolutely and i suppose that the ability to maintain as a navy so very well showed with the with the stitching and, and repairs and these and you with the salt boxes and what have you yeah i just saw a question i seem to explain the salt boxes a little again just in a yes, little bit do, of detail yeah. so um they're sort of boxes that go in so there's an inner hull and an outer hull um and in there is sort of a gap and you'd put rock salt into there so that when fresh water was to come in, it would mix with the salt water. Now, fresh water would rot the wood and salt water preserves it. So it's in order to preserve the wood during um, the Antarctic winters is essentially why they're there. It's, 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 it's counterintuitive in some ways. You always think salt's yeah. going to destroy everything, but actually <laughs> strengthening your wood. And over to you, Hugh, I'm mean, thinking about the materials used in Halley. I mean, it's great um, modern materials, a very modern looking building. I mean, the buildings we look after, of course, are all, uh, you know, uh, pine pine timbers and tar paper. I mean, what kind of materials are kind of you, you, have you been experimenting with in terms of the, the modern buildings? And anything, anything you're kind of taking inspiration from for the past? Yes, it's quite it's interesting that I think I think whilst whilst we might talk about looking back at the past for many of the inspirations, probably for the materials, we're much more looking forward to to the future buildings, which can be allowing buildings to be as far as possible prefabricated outside of Antarctica um, and at the same time creating very airtight very warm environments which lead as little energy as possible to keep them warm. So for example, at the Halley Research Station, the whole of the outside of the building is made of a sandwich of glass fiber with um, high-tech foams inside, which give it a high level of thermal resistance, um, which means that in some of the spaces, we barely need any heating at all. Uh, Purely the heat given off by computers and so on is almost enough to keep the spaces uh, warm enough. And we're always looking at ways in which we can um, maximize the size of the building panels, which enclose the buildings, so that we reduce the numbers of connections, reduce the places that air or snow might be able to find a passage into the building. Um, so uh, it's a bit it's a bit like I think it's more like that transition between the clothing from um, some of the older fibers to the new man-made fibers in the same way the buildings are heading more towards man-made type systems to try and keep the people inside as warm and as safe for as long as possible so that the buildings can be as sustainable as possible. Hmm. I think that's a really, really good point. Which touches on my my sort of last t- talking point, really, before we go to the, the, the viewers' questions, is about cl- the future and the climate change. <clears throat> a big issue uh, for all of us, especially in in the Antarctic. How do you think climate change is going to be impacting design for the future in buildings, in ships, and in clothing? So, I mean, uh, Hugh touched on it already. Do you want to kind of expand that point a little? Sure, sure. I think I think um, uh, climate change. Uh, is important in terms of thinking about what's going to happen to the buildings at their end of their life. So we now put a great amount of effort into thinking about how buildings can be uh, decommissioned and removed from Antarctica. And again, this kind of concept of modular buildings, which can be easily lifted up and taken away, whether in sections or in their entirety, um, is becoming more and more prevalent, I think, in the Antarctic uh, regions. Um, obviously, we're also looking at ways to reduce fuel usage and at Scott Base, 97% of the building's energy will actually be provided by wind power rather than by carbon technologies, which will be a dramatic step forward for these Antarctic buildings. We look at recycling water, minimising water usage um, through the use of vacuum drainage to flush the toilet. So only using one litre to flush the toilet compared to nine litres in a standard toilet. Um, There are so many different devices using LED lighting, obviously, um, um, 
t taking the heat out of uh, extract air and using it to warm intake air. Uh, many, many examples of ways that we're constantly now driving down the energy usage, trying to make these buildings as sustainable as possible, recognizing, of course, that in the first place, you've had to take them to the Antarctic, which I suppose isn't such a sustainable activity. So we've got to counteract that once they're in use to minimize their carbon footprint. Mm, thank you. And uh, in, I suppose in terms of ships, I mean, a, a changing climate, you're getting a slightly changing uh, environment. And what, what do you think, you know, Discovery was very well adapted to her environment 100 years ago. But what, what do you think uh, these days? Think about Sir David Attenborough, for example. Yeah, exactly. And, and the Discovery was a duality. She was a three masted sailing ship. And she also had a massive great big steam engine that needed tons and tons of coal to make her go. So there was both in there. And I think a lot of the questions that when I'm doing climate change workshops with children is we're asking why 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 go down there how do we make the cost benefit of the actual going down there because once you're there as we've mentioned you can live very sustainably you have to live very sustainably because you have finite resources the getting down there is often the bit that is the most impactful on the environment so I think it is one of those big questions about how we power the ships going forward because sail isn't quite enough but using those sustainable fuels and, and methods of transportation to get ourselves down there and and thinking carefully about why we're going and making sure that the work that we're doing down there offsets the perhaps the damage that we do in getting down there because it is one of those incredible places that is absolutely life-changing if you get to go but should that be available to everyone it's a really interesting one to hear like young people's thoughts on absolutely and we're seeing hybrid ships now of course with the yeah. battery power and what have you so it's, it's a fascinating time i think for design is it and naomi just thinking about clothing and a changing climate i mean our experience in, on the antarctic winter is certainly getting wetter as it's, as it's getting mm. warmer so i think our certainly the team we send south you know the needs we have for clothing is you know is changing slightly but have you seen anything in in your experiences uh, thinking about polar clothing how things changing and might change with the impact of climate change I think there is um, certainly there's more of an emphasis going on about mending. Um, so it's it's making high quality kit um, that is mendable and can be used again and again and again and again. And as you said, with changing temperatures as well and with wetter weather, it's having clothing that's multi-use, multi-purpose in many ways. So it can cope with wet, it can cope with the dry, and it's got the venting, it's got all the extra bits. Plus, they have loads of pockets these days. What's not to like? <laughs> Absolutely, I quite agree. <laughs> now, this is again a couple of comments talking about ventile, which is a you know a real classic um, out, out of fabric and uh, something that um, I think uh, one of our Rodri Jones has, has a ventile anorex since uh, for sixty years and it's still going strong. And I know it's a, it's a fabric that's certainly coming back into fashion. So it's uh, interesting to see these innovations. Okay, I'm going to go to some uh, questions from the listeners because uh, the viewers because there's quite a few uh, stacked up here. So if I could take the first one, please. Here we go, a question here for you, Naomi. If you were heading out to the Antarctic today, what would you want your gear to be made out of? Oh, do you know, I would absolutely rely on the experts um, and I would not go to the past for my advice. I would go straight to the storekeepers at the British Antarctic Survey and say, give me your best. And I would want some amazing, amazing sunglasses from them because, you know, I'm hopeless in sunny weather. Um, so, yeah. That's what I'd go for. <laughs> well, there was a... <laughs> I was hoping you could say finesco boots. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you very much for that question. Uh, can I have the next one, please? Here we go. Building on Nikki's question, <clears throat> which of the materials used in the 1900s do we still value today? I'm going to pose that to you, Naomi, first, and then uh, I'll let the other two think about that. Too. Um, well, you know, it's got to be merino wool, hasn't it? I mean... It's super warm and, you know, it's still going. It's still going. We're still using it as, you know, as a material, as a fabric. So that's what I'd yeah. say. I, I wouldn't go south without my merino underwear, I have to say, for sure. <laughs> and uh, Hugh, what about you? Any materials that uh, you talk very much, very eloquently about the modern materials, but are, are there things that from the 1900s, say, that you'd seen in the in the, the huts of the heroic era that uh, you'd, you'd follow? Oh, I think, I think timber. 
um, you know, and probably going to come back much more into fashion in the construction of future Antarctic buildings, because obviously um, it's far more sustainable than building buildings um, and in some other, other other materials. And we're also already seeing a move towards that. The beautiful Belgian station, Princess Elizabeth, uh, is built with a timber frame. There's a new Polish station about to be constructed, which is also built with a timber frame. And I think those are things which we will see increasingly uh, in the future. So a return to timber construction, but just construction which might be a little bit more airtight and a little bit better insulated than some of those early huts. Mm, interesting, isn't it? Maybe a resurgence of the Bolton and Paul flat pack. Yeah. <laughs> so dear to our hearts at UKHT. <laughs> and Kim, how about, how about you? Any materials you think it would be? Yeah, I think we are mostly a wooden ship. <laughs> um, um, and I think it is the case of just yeah, maybe just sticking to more the principles, just using the best thing that you have at the time um, and making sure that you're making it suitable. So we have like, you know, separated um, rooms just in case you flood. There was quite a few leaks on the ship and and those sorts of things. So I think, yeah, making sure that the, the panting beams and stuff like that so that your ship is robust enough and not too much has changed in that regard, I don't think. Yeah, it's interesting it's suiting your choice of material to the real purpose and really, really giving that some real thought. It's fascinating, isn't it? Okay, another question from our from our audience. Here we go. One here for you. As well as colour, have you taken into account the light spectrum and its effect on melatonin via the pineal gland? I think that the blue spectrum is important in the winter. Oh, that's a great, that's a great question, and uh, yes, certainly one of the things which we put quite a lot of effort into. Uh, we actually worked with a lighting de um, designer on uh, the development of Halley, and in fact, all all the other stations we're working on. And at Halley, we developed a special alarm clock. They're now quite common; you can buy them in quite a few shops. But one um, which um, balances the amount of uh, melatonin and serotonin by giving you a full dawn created by simulated daylight in the lamp type, so that as you wake up in the middle of uh, the winter when it's dark outside, uh, you just get that kind of balance just about right uh, mm -hmm. to help you through the day. So, you know, using daylight simulation within the lighting systems is a key part of the design of these new buildings to try and support people's well-being. If someone, if someone starts going out of cycle with the daily pattern, it can cause chaos both to them psychologically, but also to the rest of the crew. So it's something that a lot of effort is put into in terms of preservation. Hugely important. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, uh, James, for that question. <clears throat> is there another question? Here we go. For front overclothing, how much is static electricity generation a factor in design? I hear it can be quite a problem. I think it's a, very much a, a ship, a building and a clothing problem. So, Naomi, do you want to take that one? <laughs> um, I don't know how much it is taken into. I mean, I presume it's taken into design now. Um, I don't know the answer to that one, Alex. I'm intrigued. I'm on a mission now. I'm going to have to find out. <laughs> Does he know? Well, I, I know that I know that static is a major problem in the Antarctic because the air is so dry because it's so cold. Um, essentially, it freezes all the moisture out of the air. And um, uh, certainly at Halley, we had the big issue because also there's no ground. It's just ice. So we had no earthing to route the buildings back to. So we had to link all the buildings together electrically and then connect them back to the, the generators so that we could earth them back to, back to those. But in a lot of the buildings, we introduce humidity to try and reduce the amount of static. Because otherwise, as you walk around, it's a very common feature in some of the more modern buildings. You touch the handrail and you get an electric shock. You open a door handle and you get an electric shock. And whilst it's mild, it's still unbelievably irritating. So coming up with methods to overcome that, I think, is a pretty good outcome. I hear you've been to Scott Base. That's, that was my experience there. Every time I touch something, it's... It zaps and pings <laughs> constantly, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> is this an issue on ships um, as well, <clears throat> Kim? Um, yeah, yeah obviously, like it's to one some extent, but I think it's one of the things that they wouldn't have been anticipating in the slightest. When when you think of um, Ross writing his novels, that was one of the main things that Markham, who founded the thing, was poring over in order to work out what they needed. They were talking to the Norwegians and the other Europeans that had gone down at the time. But in terms of actually being able to prep for it, it I don't know how much I don't know how much um, research or ways to contradict that they'd actually managed to put in. Mm. Yeah, interesting question. Thanks very much, Alex. Uh, another question, please. Oh, 
Let's see if there's another question. Here we go. One from Michelle. How did each speaker get interested in working on Antarctica-based work and what path did you take to get here? So a little bit of biography, please. Um, so Kim, how about you? Um, <laughs> completely by accident. <laughs> um, so I have a theatre education and a museum education background. So it's stories that draw me. Um, so yeah, when I, because I, Dundee Heritage Trust covers um, the RRS Discovery and it also covers Virgin Works and which is a jute mill in Dundee and just being able to get my teeth into those stories it just really appealed to me because they're they're so extraordinary and so unique in some cases or and so generalized in others like we can all um relate I think to the stories that were there so it's it's always been stories that have drawn me to things um but yeah the fact that Antarctica is a happy coincidence <laughs> I hear you on that one how about you Naomi how, what's your path been to the, the Scott Polar? Well, I was a teacher and um, like Kim, I'm utterly drawn to a good story and, um, and, and love museum objects. So I was doing some um, volunteer work and um, well, there were two things really. I was, I was transcribing some of the um, museum original accession registers and came across a fabulous pair of string underpants and an amazing report written about how terrible they were, so they should not be used, which, I mean, who doesn't love a good story about string underpants? And I was hooked, basically. I wanted to know more. <laughs> I think we can all see why. <laughs> Thank you. And Hugh, you've very much become a great specialist in pol polar architecture and Antarctic architecture. Is that is was that always the dream? Was that uh, were we taking no, <laughs> just like the other two, sort of slightly by chance? I, I found myself one morning in 2004 listening to the radio, and I heard the then um, head of the Royal Institute of British Architects and Chris Rapley, who was head of the British Antarctic Survey, discussing their plans for a new Halley research station. And I remember telling my colleagues at work and they said, oh, well, you must go along to the launch because whatever happens, you'll at least get an hour of beautiful photographs of Antarctic scenery and penguins. And uh, they were quite right. And so began an incredible sort of subsequent career working on and designing Antarctic buildings. But it completely came out of came from left field. That's certainly for sure. Mm. Mm. But certainly you're, you're shaping the visual you know, the visual landscape in, in parts of Antarctica where your buildings are. I think it's a fascinating career. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, any other questions, please? Oh, here we go. Hugh, what can we learn from your buildings for designing for climate change in the UK? Is there any learning um, I, 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 I hope that there are actually lessons there. Um, I think that... Um, the reduced water usage of the buildings in the Antarctic is something that could be quite easily transferred uh, to buildings in more temperate environments. Buildings which are really airtight and really well insulated, so that they use much less energy. Uh, buildings which are prefabricated and therefore can be deployed much more quickly uh, to a high, far higher level of quality and therefore be far more energy efficient. Um, also buildings which can be removed quickly. I think that's also um, important. Um, buildings which support well-being. I, I, I sometimes think that, you know, when we're working in extreme environments, it, it, you know, we were, are sort of highly focused on supporting people and coming up with solutions which are helping them in the most extreme environments. And it's a bit like designing, you know, high performance vehicles or aeroplanes or so on. Those lessons can be taken and transferred much more to a mass market, maybe watered down the degree of technology, but still help significantly in addressing some of the big climate change issues that we've got today so yeah I think there are a lot of lessons that can be can be taken into sort of construction in the UK and, and I hopefully they they are and will be absolutely thank you very much and thank you for your question Matt <clears throat> another question please there we go one from Simon you again. <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting our money's worth out of you. Thanks for your awesome talk. What are the plans to make Antarctic habitation greener? Many buildings seem to run off hydrocarbons at the moment. <clears throat> it, it is true, um, but there is an increasing move towards more sustainable forms of uh, energy production, but it comes with big challenges. So as I mentioned, Scott Base will be 97% powered by wind power, and um, there's a new wind farm being constructed as part of the Scott Base redevelopment on Crater Hill, just above the station, uh, which will then share power with the American station at McMurdo as well. So helping to green both developments. 
Um, I think wind wind is obviously the number one solution. But it, as I say, it comes with challenges. Some of the winds in the Antarctic are really, really ferocious in excess of 200 miles per hour. And so you've got to be able to design wind turbines which can withstand that degree of um, pressure from, from the wind. Um, there's some reliance on solar technology, but of course, for half the year, it's dark. So then we need increasing technologies in terms of battery storage to be able to harness that solar power and use it through the winter. But I think um, as carbon, the impacts of carbon, hydrocarbons become increasingly, you know, well, obviously very apparent, um, but also more and more expensive. There's going to be greater and greater pressure on anyone developing an Antarctic building to cut down its energy use, first of all, through the design of the fabric that's uh, enclosing it, and then cut, um, look at alternative sources of energy to try and again drive down the hydrocarbon uh, use. But some of the technologies are emerging, some of them are well established, and there needs to be a sort of confluence between the two to get to the sort of happy place where really we've got rid of hydrocarbons altogether. And the ambitions of nations to achieve that by 2040 is reflected in the strategies that we're seeing people like the British Antarctic Survey, Antarctica New Zealand, or the NSF in the US are all driving towards that similar target. I think that's um, a really good point. And is there, is there much room for solar energy? I mean, uh, any, any valid for, I suppose, 50% of the year, I guess, but... Uh, yeah, is that but we're still, we, are see, we are seeing a lot a lot of that. Um, and we're seeing for, I mean, there there are some trailblazing stations, as I mentioned before, the Brazil, the um, uh, Belgian station, Princess Elizabeth, uses significant amounts of solar and uh, wind power. Um, uh, certainly at Scott Base, we're looking at introducing a solar, solar farm on the outside of the new Discovery Building for the British Antarctic Survey. The whole of the north elevation is covered with photovoltaic panels, which will again um, create energy to help drive that that building as, as well. So, yeah. And move to more and more solar power, more and more wind power, and then experiments in battery storage, uh, hydrogen fuel, um, potentially even using um, the power of the uh, sort of changing tides, although that again is fraught with problems with uh, instrumentation freezing up or being damaged by um, sea ice. Mm. And I suppose that, that speaks to the extremes, isn't it? Is that's the that's the problem. I mean, we know at yeah. uh, Port Lockwood we say the the temperatures can, you know, could be forty degrees d different, you know, in, within a week, and uh, mm. that can cause great problems with uh, some materials for sure. And can I just ask ask about um, how Antarctic design in all all of your areas? How, how is this influencing the rest of the world? Are you seeing? You know how um, you know clothing is is being taken up in other other places or by other people or, or designers, um, again with ships and things. Are you seeing any of those innovations coming through uh, elsewhere? Oh, should we start with Naomi clothing? Are you seeing anything like that? <clears throat> I mean, looking at the historic clothing, um, we certainly do have designers sometimes coming to look at the collection for design inspiration, for like a fashion statement as opposed to really good Antarctic clothing you know that's not what it's um what it's being visited for um but certainly as a design fashion statement it is still being studied by people sometimes um which I find quite fascinating um that people are getting their inspiration from museum collections I think that's great I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's one, one of the purposes of museum collections I think <laughs> And what about what about your ships? Are these uh, any innovations you're seeing? I mean, from the Discovery or from other ships that you've seen elsewhere? Yeah, I think what's fascinating is that the Discovery was the last ship of her kind. Like they just didn't quite make them like that anymore. They didn't. They when Scott and Shackleton went back down, they they just used whalers. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't quite have the ship that was purposely built for Discovery. Obviously, as we've gone on, these sort of purpose-built scientific vessels have gone on the the shuttle the discover discovery was was named for these theories of ships that have gone on massive discoveries so i think just ev like in every time of discovery you see these sort of it, it's almost a first and last sort of thing she was one of the first research vessel vessels like exclusively research vessels ever created but she was also mm -hmm. the last of the the wood built three masted ships Yeah, fascinating. And, and um, this midpoint, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so you froze there for a moment, but uh, I think we got we got you. Thank you. And Hugh, I mean, you talked a bit about the inspiration of the Antarctic design and buildings and architecture influencing contemporary design and architecture. But are you seeing, um, in terms of the in terms of um, climate adapt adaptation, but are you seeing you know that kind of modular designs, that sort of thing? Are you seeing these things in other parts of the world? Yeah, I think I think m more and more we're seeing pr sort of examples of prefabrication and modularization. The thing the thing about in the Antarctic is it, it all tends to be very well connected together. So um, uh, all, all the all the building components are brought together by the, by the builders, uh, assembled <clears throat> off site, and then taken to the Antarctic. Whereas within the wider constructions industry, there may be components which are prefabricated, but there's still an, in my opinion, far too much stuff which is taking place on site. The the other area which I might just mention because people might find interesting is mm. the transference of knowledge gained in Antarctica into the space industry. Mm. And um, one of the one of the things that I've found <clears throat> quite exciting and surprising out of our work in the Antarctic has been the engagement we've had, particularly with NASA and the European Space Agency, particularly around well-being of people. So le less around the kind of technical aspects of the construction, because obviously they're already very sophisticated, but they're very interested in how people survive in these extreme environments, cut off from the rest of the world, what devices we've used, and particularly at the, the kind of, you know, what one might consider the more simple end, you know, the quality of lighting, the, um, the, the extent of personal space, the use of colour, and how those could be applied to spaceship design to sustain crews who will be travelling to Mars for nine months, let alone the period of time that they might spend once they get there. And uh, I think it is quite interesting the way that there is this kind of knowledge transfer, you know, back to more temperate environments, but also into something quite as high tech as the space industry. And Antarctica just shows us again and again and again how many lessons can be learned and how valuable those can be outside the icy continent itself. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, well, our hour is just about up, I'm afraid. I mean, I was, I was going to talk about aesthetics and beauty as well, but uh, maybe for another time. And I think there's certainly a, another a webinar to be had in, in Antarctica and space, isn't there? But um, Hugh, Kim, Naomi, thank you all so much for a, a fascinating evening. And we could certainly go on for another couple of hours, I think, easily. But uh, thank you very much to our audience uh, as well for your great questions. We managed to get through some of them, but um, not all. We'll try and answer some of them in the chat. So um, we shall see what we can do there for you. Um, thank you to you for your fascinating stories, insights. Um, I think we'll all look a bit more carefully at our waterproofs from now on and certainly our underwear. <laughs> so thank you to the three of you very much for, for this wonderful evening. It's been great to do this in collaboration with the Dundee Heritage Trust, our partners up in Dundee. And if any, any, any members of our audience are up in Dundee, then I would really urge you to go and see, uh, go to Discovery Point to visit the ship. It's an amazing day out. And, uh, you know, Kim might pop up and say hi as well. Thank you to all of you in, your, in the audience for joining us tonight and for sharing your questions. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, uh, please let us know what you thought of tonight's event. Uh, leave your comments uh, in the chat or get in touch with us by email or on social media. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is the last in the current series of Antarctica Insight Live. I hope you've enjoyed it, taking part as much as we have uh, in making it. Uh, we've covered an awful lot of ground, and so if you've missed any of the editions, they're all available for catch-up on our YouTube channel or via our website, so please do check those out if you haven't seen them already. They're also worth watching again, I think. Uh, it's always something new to learn. We would love your feedback, so please do get in touch with any comments uh, and feedback that you might have. I just want to pay tribute to the team behind the scenes. There's a few people behind that you can't see who've worked tirelessly in putting the series together. It's a real team effort, but I particularly want to thank Jesse Norman, our series producer, for being the driving force and for keeping us all highly organised, <laughs> much needed, and I think herding cats sometimes is the comment. Uh, and thank you very much to our sponsor, Viking Cruises, for supporting the whole season of Antarctica Insight Live. So we're hugely grateful for that support. If you haven't already, please do consider supporting our work at UKHT or the work at the Dundee uh, Heritage Trust do. Um, ways to support uh, are going to be shared in the comments for you, um, but you can check out our websites on our social media feeds. Um, every gift, every follow, every like helps our organisations to continue to secure the legacy of all those who have gone before us in Antarctica and to, for us to preserve this incredible heritage, a lot of which you've been hearing about tonight. So please do follow us on social media, check out our websites, <laughs> you know, stick around for updates and to hear about other ways you can get involved. There are lots of things you can do. 
Uh, we are planning our future season for Antarctica Insight Live, and we'll announce the program later in the year. Uh, probably be launching that in the autumn winter time. But if there are any topics that you'd like us to cover, then please let us know. Um, we'd, um, we'd, there's all so much we could talk about, so we want to hear from you and hear what you'd like to hear about. But for now, thank you everybody for making this such an enjoyable era, evening and enjoyable series. And I look forward to seeing you again later in the year. Thank you very much, and good night. Thank you.